Everyone hated him for being a weak, cursed boy, but he turns out to be the strongest wizard alive. Seath is an unlucky loser living in a world full of magic and monsters, whose hometown got destroyed in a monster attack. Thankfully for him, Alma, a one-handed wizard soccer mom, was able to save his life and adopted him as his student. Steve is still unable to control his magical abilities, but just to show off to his best friend Tommy, he steals Alma's magic books and tries to use some flashy-sounding spells out of them. They do not work, and he decides to use his own magic spells instead. Seth charges magic in his fists and then chants Satama's name before punching a giant boulder into the atmosphere. The boulder ends up crashing on a farm and a bunch of angry elephant cows attack him, forcing him to run for his life. Thankfully, Alma shows up and uses her wind magic to stop the cows and saves his pathetic ass. She's about to teach him a lesson for his constant troublemaking when the villagers start throwing stones at her calling her a monster. Steph tries to defend her, but Alma knows these dipshit muggles don't have a brain to begin with and flies away with Seth back to their floating house. Back in the house, Seth is forced to clean the walls as his punishment, while Alma tells him how these pathetic muggles are racist pigs who hate wizards. He hates that people mistreat wizards when they are the ones who deal with the monsters. Alma replies that muggles don't understand magic, that is why they think that they are like monsters. This gives Seth an idea, and he decides to become the strongest wizard and wipe out all monsters, so that everyone can live in peace. He sneaks out of the house the very next day and goes to show Tommy his magic again, but learns that his stupid muggle parents don't want him hanging around wizards anymore. Seth whines, saying that they don't understand how cool magic is. Suddenly, Tommy notices something falling from the sky, and Seth recognizes it as the black and white monster egg. Seth realizes that the zebra-looking egg is coming straight for the village and Alma is in another city to fight a monster, which means that he needs to step up and protect these filthy muggles. He immediately tells Tommy to evacuate the area while he heads home and gears up for battle, carrying magic weapons, explosives, and healing potions with him. Before he could even begin his journey though, things went wrong as the bats dropped his ass as the weight was too heavy for them to carry and he lands on top of the egg. He can't believe that he survived the fall, but acts cool as he sees the crowd and tells them that he will take care of the monster on his own. The egg suddenly hatches and a monster comes out of it, tossing Seth in the sky, while he immediately throws a giant explosive bottle towards the monster, but it does no damage. He uses his magic sword next, but it shatters on impact and the monster punches Seth through a building. He realizes that the monster is above his league, but then notices that Tommy is too scared to move and the monster is heading towards him. Steph gets out of the rubble and protects his friend by blocking the monster's attack. Tommy immediately takes off as Seth tells him to run away, but then he gets crushed under the monster's arm. He tries to fight back but can't even get up, but then suddenly, a flashy attack comes from the sky and pushes the monster back. Steph looks up and spots a group of wizards standing on a flying broom. They restrain the monster before their leader introduces himself as Don and his group as the Brave Quartet. He tells the villagers to leave the monster to his team and Seth is really excited to meet wizards other than Alma for the first time. He asks Don to let him fight alongside them, claiming that he will be helpful. The villagers don't want Seth to fight since his horns are proof that he has been cursed, but Don lifts his hat to reveal demonic wings and a tail on his bald head. He tells everyone that all wizards are cursed and the boy is nothing special. He trusts Seth and asks him to be the decoy to distract the monster while the villagers evacuate. With that, the brave quartet rushes to evacuate the people and Seth waits in front of the monster, waiting for it to be freed. He uses his special move, Titan Punch, on it, but the attack has no effect on the bouncy monster. Steve is forced to run as the monster chases after him. He jumps high using a pole and lands a kick on the monster's face, giving it a serious dent. He then tries attacking the monster from behind, but gets bounced away into the watchtower. He wonders how he can stall the monster and gets an idea to use a strong iron chain to trap it. He begins throwing stones at the monster, thinking he is harmless now, but the monster gathers magic and shoots a powerful beam at him. Steph somehow dodged the destructive attack, but then he hears Tommy's screams. It turns out that Don and his men are a bunch of robbers, and they have tied everyone in the bank to loot the money. Seth reaches the bank and hears their diabolical plan and asks them what they are doing. He claims that it is the duty of wizards to save people from monsters, and Don laughs at him. He claims that there is no merit in saving these people, who always treat them as outcasts and come running whenever a monster attacks. The villagers prove him right by blaming Seth for bringing the monster here and helping the robbers, and Don gives him a I told you so. He throws a pouch of gold coins towards Seth to thank him for stalling the monster, but he furiously punches him in the face and sends him crashing into the wall. He takes two others down, but as he attacks the dumb guy, he gets deflected away by his shield magic. 
Stith is on the ground, but Don doesn't want to finish him off. He leaves him alive to see with his own eyes how the villagers will treat him even after he risked it all to save them. Suddenly, the monster frees itself from the chains and starts heading towards the bank, so Don decides to run away. Soon, the monster arrives at the bank. Everyone is terrified as it charges his magic beam. But Sith stands up in front of them and declares that everything will be alright. The monster fires the magic beam at him, and Seth blocks it with his hands and his gloves that allow him to use magic get torn. The attack ends, but the monster starts charging for another round. Seth gathers magic into his bare hands before the monster can attack, and hits it with a powerful titan punch. His attack creates a hole through the monster's body, and Seth falls to his knees, thinking that the battle is over. However, the monster gets up once again, and Seth has no power left to face it. Luckily, Alna returns from her mission just then and she finishes off the monster to save her student. She takes him home where he wakes up with his body aching all over. As soon as he sees Alma, he bombards her with questions about what happened to the villagers. She tells him that everyone is safe, and she even caught the robbers. Seth is relieved, but Alma is not because he used magic barehanded, even though she had forbidden it. Apparently, no other wizard in the world can use magic without special gloves, and Alma wanted to keep Seth safe from the Holy Knights, who hate wizards and target the unique ones like him. She believes that the villagers have seen everything and will surely snitch to the knights, but Sif believes they won't do that. Alma doesn't believe his words and thinks that it is foolish to hope for the villagers to be grateful to them. Sif tells her about his dream to destroy all the monsters in the world to bring about world peace. Alma tells him that it is impossible because there are too many monsters in the world, and he replies that he will find their nest and destroy it. Alma sighs as she tells him about the legend of Radiant, the nest of monsters that no one has ever reached. Seth's eyes widen in awe as he hears this, and he declares that he will find Radiant and destroy it. Alma tells him that it is just a fairy tale, but he wants to give it a try nevertheless. She puts him to sleep, and then she recalls her first meeting with the boy. She does not remember anything except the fact that she saved him from a burning town, and lost her memories while protecting him. Alma had no idea who she was or who Seth was, but she decided to look after him as her own son. She took him along on her journey, and they traveled to different places to find any clues about their identity. No one could tell them anything, and they always left empty-handed. However, Alma knew that she was a wizard, and so was Seth. She took on the job of monster hunting and went on a mission one day, leaving Seth on his own. As he was creating a snowman, some kids from the nearby village arrived there and started attacking him. They called him a cursed monster and thrashed him even as Seth told them that he had done nothing to harm them. He asked them to stop, and then suddenly, his powers went out of control and he released a powerful shockwave. When Alma returned, she found that their home had been destroyed and Seth was missing. The villagers had tied him to a stake and wanted to kill him. They claimed that if they touched him, they would get infected too, but as they were about to burn him, their torches went out. Alma appeared on the scene and touched one man, saying that he was also infected now. She threatened to touch and curse everyone, and they ran for their lives. Alma freed Sif, and as he cried in her arms, she realized that she must protect him from the muggles at all costs. That is why she got a floating house where no one could harm them. As Alma gets off the nostalgia train, she takes out Seth's childhood clothes from a box, thinking about how much he has grown. The next day, Seth has fully recovered from his injuries, and he plans to sneak out of home to find Radiant. However, Alma knows him too well, and she is waiting for him outside. She doesn't scold him and instead gives him her broom as well as some supplies to help him on his journey. She calls every parting gift, and then she gives him his magic gloves that she stitched back. Alma asks him to promise that he won't become a monster, and he replies that he will just become the greatest wizard. With that, Seth runs off, but he turns back midway and hugs Alma. He cries, and she caresses him while telling him to take care of himself. With that, he flies away, and Alma cries only after he is out of her sight. Steph looks at the villagers below, and they bid him farewell too. He waves at them one last time, and then begins his journey to find Radiant. Unfortunately, he crashes into a ship of the Holy Knights, and they arrest him. Seth tries explaining that he thought it was Taylor Swift's private jet and came here for an autograph, but they are not ready to listen and try to subdue him by force. He punches a few of them, but then everyone gangs up on him. He simply blows them all away with magic, and Captain Dart Dragonall of the Holy Knights is now certain that he is a wizard. The Nick Fury Wanig tells Seth that all wizards are to be arrested if they cannot produce any permit or identification. Seth says that the law is stupid, but the captain doesn't care about his snowflake opinions and orders his men to arrest him. They take away his stuff and put him in a cage made of black silver, which doesn't let wizards gather magic. Dart reveals that he will be sent to prison for 10 years just because he is a wizard without a permit, and Seth asks him when he is going to search for Radiant then. 
The captain knows the fairy tale about Radiant and tells Seth that the world is taboo, and you should never speak out loud if he values his life. With that, Seth is lowered down despite his constant whining and bitching. In the dark room, he recalls how Alma always told him to keep his horns hidden. He also remembers that she told him to go to a town called Artemis, where wizards and researchers gather. Alma believes that Artemis has a better chance of having information about Radiant than any other place. She asked him to look for a powerful wizard named Yaga and also advised him to steer clear of the yellow cat in the town. As Seth is revising all these points, he opens his eyes to find a small weird bird in front of him. He freaks out upon seeing it and the bird flies and hides in the hair of a girl in the next cell. It seems the girl traded off all her brain cells in exchange for more hair and she wakes up from her long beauty sleep unbothered by the fact that she is in a cage. She introduces herself as Meli, a wizard apprentice from Artemis, and tells Seth that she was on the way to complete a job but got lost and ended up here. Coincidentally, she was going to Seth's town to collect the remains of the monster there. Meli says that the only person who can prove her identity is her boss, Adak, and she hopes that he finds her soon. As they are about to shake hands and become friends, the airship shakes and it turns out that Doc's ship has been apprehended by the Holy Knights. He has alleged ID, but he is carrying the remains of the monster Seth hunted, so he wants to get out of this pickle as soon as possible. Melly spots him and asks him if he is here to free her. Doc panics to see that she is captured and asks her what happened. She tells him that she lost her way while trying to collect the remains of a monster, and Doc realizes she is done for. Dark comes there and he orders him to be arrested too, because possessing monster remains is illegal. Now the three of them are in cages and Doc can't bear talking with his airhead assistant anymore. Seth asks him if he is also a wizard from Artemis, and he replies that he is a researcher, and was trying to take back the monster corpse for research. Seth proudly tells him that he was the one who killed that monster, but Doc is not happy that he damaged it too much in the process. He tells the grumpy man to kill a monster himself then, but he is too much of a chicken to even attempt that. Seth then spouts his dream of destroying Radiant to change the world, and while Doc just scoffs at him, Melly is amused by the idea. He then asks Doc to take him to Artemis, but there seems to be no hope of even escaping from their cages. Just then, Millie's pet Mr. Bubbly comes there with the keys to the cages he stole from the Holy Knights and the three prisoners are free. They sneak around to look for Seth's stuff before they can escape, but just as they find it, Dart finds them. They freak out as the soldiers surround them and the captain tells them that trying to run away will earn them an even greater sentence. Doc tries to prove his innocence and blames Seth for forcing him to escape, but Dart orders them to be arrested. Steph can't take it anymore and he uses his special move Titan Punch to send the knights flying. He charges at them, telling Melly and Doc to get his stuff back for him. Melly is sent flying because of the shockwave from his punch and lands on all the confiscated stuff. She gets her wand back and just as the archers are about to shoot Seth, she uses a magic barrier to keep him safe. Her barrier can't hold out against multiple rounds of arrows and it ultimately shatters. Steph and Melly are surrounded by the soldiers, with no chance to escape. The girl suddenly loses consciousness, and what comes out is her second personality. Apparently, her curse is the same one that makes Bruce Banner turn into Hulk, and whenever she gets stressed beyond a point, her aggressive and violent personality comes out. The crazy Melly blows away the soldiers surrounding her and then attacks the rest, but Dart suddenly appears next to her with an arrow pointed at her head. He declares that she is sentenced to death for fighting against holy knights, but Seth has got his stuff back and he yells at the captain to not hurt the girl. He rides towards him on his broom and tries to hit him with a titan punch, but Dart dodges and Seth hits the ship instead, causing it to lose balance. Seth picks up Doc and Melly and heads back to their ship so that they can escape. They escape at full speed, and as a knight seeks the captain's permission to shoot them down, he refuses. He doesn't want to do anything bold now that the wizards are heading to Artemis, but he can't stop thinking about Seth, who used magic with his bare hands. On Doc's ship, Seth tells Melly how amazing her offensive spells were, She's happy to hear that because everyone else has always rebuked her for that. Soon, the floating city of Artemis comes into view and Seth is ready to explore it. He is enthralled by the futuristic city where everyone travels in airships. They dock the ship and then leave for the security checkpoint, where the lady asks Seth some routine security questions. She wants to know if he is planning to register as a resident of Artemis, and Melly explains that unless he is a resident, he won't be able to take advantage of the various services and won't be able to become a monster hunter either. Steve thinks he doesn't need to become a resident because he is just here to meet Yaga, but as Doc hears his words, he desperately insists he become a resident. He tells the boy that Yaga probably won't even meet him if he is not a resident and runs away with him to the admission ceremony. He gets tired after climbing a few stairs and Seth takes this chance to look at the city once again. Melly claims that it is called the Paradise of Wizards 
and no one discriminates against them here. Doc tells him he is getting late for the admission ceremony, and Sith holds his hand as he drags him along too. They reach the Academy Castle at the top of the city, and the announcer hypes up the crowd to welcome the Academy's founder and headmaster and majesty, a talking cat wizard. Seth thinks he is the yellow cat Alma warned him to stay away from. Majesty begins his speech, talking about his goal to eradicate the curses that infect the wizards after they make contact with monsters. He then calls the newcomers on stage and there are only three of them. The cat hands them out their contracts that they need to sign if they want to become residents. Seth isn't convinced, but Majesty eggs him on, telling him about the various sweet bonuses they offer. He decides to sign it, and the cat smirks as the contract is complete. As soon as it is signed, the small page unfolds into a full roll, and it turns out that everyone got scammed. The yellow cat had put more hidden charges and taxes in the contract than they do here in the States to ensure that all the newbies were in serious debt. They are expected to pay those debts off by working as hunters for the Academy. Sith and the others are shocked, and it turns out that the crowd is full of assholes who knew this would happen. And they were here, just to see others suffer. Doc laughs in a corner because this is his plan to keep Seth busy so that he won't bother him ever again. Well, Karma is a bitch, and Doc learns it the hard way because he has been registered as Seth's guardian in the documents, so he is equally responsible for paying off his debt. Later, Seth realizes what Alma meant when she asked him not to get involved with the yellow cat, but it is too late now. Melly says it was the same with her, but she doesn't even care anymore. Seth agrees, saying that as soon as he finds the wizard named Yaga, he is going to run away. Millie is ready to support him too, and they start searching for Yaga. They can't find him, so they take a walk around and find that there is a price for everything. From walking on normal bridges to taking the escalators, and even when people seem to help them, they are there just to earn some money. Seth keeps on racking up debt for Doc to pay off, and they enter a bar to gain information on Yaga. While Seth gets a lecture for trying to order something to drink, Melly goes ahead and asks a man about Yaga. He is drunk and rude to her, and that flips her switch and brings crazy Melly out. She attacks the rude man, and the entire bar explodes along with the debt on them. At the end of the day, they have more debt than the sum of student debt of all Americans, and Seth earns the title of Debt King. He doesn't mind it the way Doc does and keeps on thinking that this place really is a town of wizards, and everyone seems happy here. Just then, they hear someone talking to them and find that the voice is coming from a midget wizard inside a pot. Seth freaks out upon seeing him, but the wizard refuses to introduce himself. He has heard that the boy is looking for Yaga and offers to point out to him if he can answer some questions first. The first thing he asks is Seth's opinion about the Academy Majesty has built, and he replies that while the cat is a creep scammer, the Academy is truly a paradise for wizards. The pot wizard is about to tell Seth the reason why Majesty charges so much money for everything when suddenly the sirens start ringing. The Holy Knights have attacked the city, and the pot wizard tells Seth to watch what happens next. The Holy Knights are Dart's men, and the Vice Captain is leading them to raid Artemis, so that they can arrest Seth. Suddenly, a huge army of wizards comes out to face them. That is not all, as they receive a message from their high command to retreat immediately. Dart comes out and exclaims that it must surely be because Majesty bribed the government officers, and he wonders where he gets money to do that from. Dart agrees to retreat because he knows that the 13 most powerful wizards are in the Academy right now, and they can easily take them down. However, he is still obsessed with Seth, and decides to tell the General of the Holy Knights about his special abilities. Back in Artemis, Seth is amazed that the Holy Knights were sent away so easily, and the Pot Wizard tells him that it was all thanks to Majesty, who does everything he can to protect the wizards of this place. Seth sees the Yellow Cat in a new light, and then the Pot Wizard comes back to the topic and asks him why he wants to meet Yaga. Sith tells him about his dream to search for and destroy Radiant, and the Pot Wizard replies that it is just a pipe dream. He tells our hero that rather than trying to find something that might not even exist, he can use his powers for a better goal, namely to stay here to protect the paradise of wizards. Seth refuses to accept that suggestion because he doesn't just want to protect the wizards, but normal people too. He declares that the world needs to be changed, and he will be the one to do it. The pot wizard is impressed and remarks that the boy is as stubborn as Alma. Seth asks him how he knows about his mom and teacher, and the wizard calls him a dumbo for not figuring out that he himself is Yaga, one of the 13 most powerful wizards in the world. Yaga takes them along, and then Seth reveals that he is Alma's student. Yaga is not impressed, and he burns the letter of recommendation, telling Seth that he doesn't care if he is Alma's student because he won't help anyone who is not strong enough. Seth decides to show off his Titan Punch to impress the midget, but he gets angry at that instead. He claims that it wasn't even magic and tells Seth to learn at least a basic attack spell like Meteor Drop if he wants to talk further. 
The next day, Seth crashes into Melly's apartment at full speed and asks her to teach him some magic. He thinks that since she is so good at it, she can make him better too, and she nervously apologizes as she says that she cannot. Offensive magic is the specialty of her crazy personality and she can't use it at all normally. Steve asks her to at least teach him how to properly channel his magic, but she sucks at explaining things, so she takes him to Doc, who is waiting outside a cafe with a flower in his hand. He plans to propose to his crush today, but freaks out when he sees Seth and Melly behind him. He says he is going to propose to the woman of her dreams today, but freezes like a deer in headlights when he sees her. The woman in question is a barista named Melba, and she introduces herself to Seth before inviting him into the cafe. She has a puppet on her hand who is her dad, and he hates Doc for crushing on his daughter. They order some food, and after eating, Seth tells Melba about his dream to destroy Radiant, and for that, he needs to grow stronger. Melly adds that she brought him to Doc since he is a researcher and can help him master magic. Doc replies that they won't get anything from him, but as Melba says, it is a wonderful thing that he is so smart. He does a 180 and tells Seth to leave everything to him. Melba decides to support everyone by giving them her special herb tea, which is terribly nasty. Doc can't drink any more of it and he runs away carrying Seth away with him. As soon as they reach the open area, he regrets his decision but cannot go back since he has promised his crush. He reads his spell book and instructs Seth to close his eyes and clear his mind before gathering the magic all around him. Doc asks him to imagine the type of spell he is going to use and then shout the incantation out loud. Seth does everything as he is told, but as he tries to use Meteor Drop, nothing comes out. He keeps trying desperately and gathers too much magic in his fist that explodes and sends Doc flying like the teen rocket. They meet at Melba's calf once again and Doc refuses to help Seth anymore after receiving various injuries. Melly is worried now, and she decides to help her friend out by bringing out her crazy personality. Crazy Melly attacks Seth with meteor drops repeatedly and forces him to run away. She keeps chasing after him, wreaking havoc through the city as he asks him to fight back. He says he can't hit a friend, but the attacks never stop coming and one of them nearly hits him, tearing his gloves and sending him crashing into a building. Crazy Melly tells him that he is not cut out to be a warrior if he can only run away from battle, and she prepares another round of attacks. Seth yells at her to warn her about the debris falling towards her, but she doesn't listen and attacks him again. He dodges and then tries to help her, hoping that he can use the meteor drop successfully this time. He gathers magic and shoots it towards the rubble, effectively destroying it. He hugs Melly, telling her that he finally learned to use meteor drop. She smiles and then suddenly, her personality reverts to normal. As normal Melly sees the damage she has caused, she freaks out and apologizes to Seth for attacking him out of nowhere. He tells her that it is fine and thanks her for helping him learn the spell. With that, he goes to Yaga and shows that he can finally use the spell he wanted. The pot wizard approves of him and Seth exclaims that he can go to Radiant now. That earns him a smack to the face and Yaga tells him that even the most seasoned and powerful wizards have never made it to Radiant, and if he wants to do it, he must train very hard for that. Yaga suddenly takes to the sky and shoots him with a magic beam, and Seth blocks it at the last moment. Yaga claims that he barely passed his test, and now he will train him hard personally. The next day, as Melly wakes up peacefully and greets her doll roommates, Seth comes crashing in again. This time, he wants her to let him have her room. Till now, he was sleeping in the park, but apparently the city really said, screw the homeless, and there was a fee to sleep outside. So Doc lectured Seth about finding a place to stay, and he came to Melly for help. She claims that being with him is fun, so she has no issues with letting him stay here. Soon after that, Seth's training begins with Yaga, who attacks him while chasing after him. Seth can't even dodge properly and gets knocked out cold by a pot beam. Later that day, he goes to Melba's cafe with her friends and Doc is not happy to share his table with them. He just wants to be alone and steal glances at Melba when she asks him if he would like to try her new coffee. Doc knows how horrible Melba's original recipes are, but he still accepts them, thinking that she will like them if he takes the offer. He is hesitant as he brings the cup to his lips, but as he takes the first sip, he finds that it is actually a decent cup of coffee. He can't contain his excitement and exclaims that it is really delicious, but as he is busy praising its taste, the sewer hole near him opens up, and an octopus tentacle throws him into the sewer. His friends can only stare at the empty hole after both the monster and Doc are gone, and they wonder if that creature was a monster. Yaga suddenly pops up the scene and tells them that the creature is actually a squid and an octopus hybrid called Squidipus, and it resides in the sewer system of Artemis. Seth fears that the creature will eat Doc, but Yaga assures everyone that the Squidopus doesn't eat people and only likes coffee. Everyone is relieved, but Melba and her dad think that Doc comes to their cafe every day, and his whole body reeks of coffee. 
which means that the creature might actually eat him as coffee-infused meat. Seth and Melly panic on hearing this, and they get even more nervous as Yaga agrees with Melba. Inside the sewers, the Squidupus drinks Doc's coffee and then starts sniffing him. But then suddenly, it is attracted to the strong scent of coffee. It heads towards its source, which is actually a giant bucket of coffee that Seth and Melly have brought along to lure it out. Seth plans to blow away the monster with his titan punch the moment he sees it. Suddenly, the sewer starts rumbling, and the Squidupus emerges out of the water, holding Doc upside down. Seth attacks it with his Titan Punch, but the creature is more rubbery than Gear 5 Luffy and sends him bouncing all over the place. He gets up and explains that the Titan Punch won't work on soft opponents when the Squidupus suddenly grabs the coffee bucket and starts running away. Seth and Melly try to attack it, but it squirts some ink on them and makes them crash into each other. The creature escapes and Seth is forced to retreat. He thinks that they should set up a trap to stop it the next time and Melly has the right thing for it. They lay out some classic jaw traps near a coffee bucket, but only Doc gets caught in them, and the Squidipus b laps Seth and Melly away. They try a fishing net and tranquilizer next, and only Doc gets hit by them. This infuriates Melly, and her switch is flipped. She attacks the creature, but is not of much use, and they are back at the cafe, battered and bruised. They are about to lose hope when Yadva comes there and asks them if they are ready to give up. Sith declares that he won't let his friend die and decides to go deep inside the sewer to save Doc, regardless of the dangers. Just then, Melba comes there with another one of her special blends, and Seth gets an idea to defeat the coffee-loving creature. They take a bucket of Melba's special blend, and Seth holds it on his shoulders to attract the Squidapus. As soon as the monster arrives, Seth tells Doc that they will certainly save him this time, but he tells him to give up and return home. He has accepted his fate of constant misfortunes and decided to live with the creature in the sewers. Seth says it might eat him, but Doc has made friends with a fellow coffee lover and even named it. He tells Seth that he doesn't want anything to do with him anymore because he is the source of all his bad luck, but Seth is not ready to accept that just yet. He pours the coffee over himself and the Squidopus is so tempted by him that it eats him. Doc is terrified at the sight, but Melly tells him that it is alright because this was Seth's plan. Suddenly, the Squidopus starts squirming and writhing in pain, and Melly explains that the coffee has more spices than even the Mexicans and Indians can handle and on top of that, it was Melba's extra special blend. Doc can tell how devastating the effect of the coffee can be, and moments later, the squid up as vomits everything in his belly along with Seth. The plan worked, and the creature is weakened. Melly traps it in a magic sphere as Seth jumps towards it to deliver the finishing blow. He hits it with a titan punch and makes it drop Doc, but the creature is not defeated yet. Seth is about to hit it again, but Doc comes ahead to save his friend and tells him not to attack it anymore. Seth understands that their bond is a real one, and he decides to befriend the squid up as too. Doc is moved, and he decides to return to the city. The next day, as they are hanging out at the cafe as usual, Seth remarks that he now knows how weak he is, and Yaga pops up just then to tell him to get ready to train again. They resume training, but because Seth is recklessly cramming magic into his fists, his gloves explode. He freaks out as the gloves were given to her by Alma, and Yaga asks him to hand them over to him. Seth complains that he won't be able to use magic legally then, and the pot wizard gives him something special to help with training. Seth is shocked as he wears special gloves with black silver fabric that prevent wizards from collecting magic power. He doesn't want them and tries to take them off, only to be electrocuted by the gloves. Seth lashes at Yaga saying that he cannot train with these gloves on, but he replies that he is not worthy of training with him in his current state anyway. He claims that just gathering a shitload of magic power won't help him grow stronger, and he is losing sight of the most important thing. Until he finds what it is, Seth can't take off the gloves. If he somehow takes them off, Yaga threatens to expel them from his training immediately. Seath is furious, and as he goes to eat lunch at Melba's, he complains about the cryptic things the pot wizard said about true power lying somewhere other than magic. Melba's dad knows that Yaga often says weird things because of all the magic shrooms, but he never says anything without meaning. Soon Doc comes running there, and it seems that Melba has started feeling his riz a little. She asks him to try some herbal tea, but he replies that they don't have time today, as Majesty has sent them an invitation. They reach his palace, and the Yellow Cat tells them that the debt they have incurred is more than the GDP of the world, and at this rate, they may never be able to repay it. Majesty says that he cannot deal with all this mess, and he will either have to expel them or make them pay somehow. The trio takes the option to pay using other means, and no, nothing that happens between them is going on the hub. Seth and Melly clean the roofs of the city, while Doc works alone in some sort of medieval factory mill while thinking about his bright and not to mention imaginary future with Melba. Soon Seth is done cleaning the roof spotlessly when he notices some people on a flying broom. 
He is curious and rushes to see them and finds that they are Don and his group of petty thieves, who were here to steal some treasure from the academy. They freak out upon seeing each other, and as Melly comes there running, she gets embarrassed on seeing them in just underwear. Seth tells her that they are a bunch of thieves who are here to raid the academy storehouses. Melly attacks them with a meteor drop and tells the surprised Seth that she has been practicing so that she doesn't have to rely on her other personality that often. Her attack was blocked and the brave quartet wizards can also use magic without gloves. Next up, Don and his men shoot magic fart missiles at her and she blocks them before realizing that their underwear is made of the same material as gloves, which enables them to use their magic. Don affirms as shoots the fart bombs again and Melly counterattacks. It is useless as their shield user can block all of their attacks and Don laughs as he realizes that Seth can't even use magic right now because of the black silver gloves. He offers to take those gloves off of him if he pretends that he didn't see anything here, but Seth refuses to make a deal with him. Don says that's a shame because he holds Seth in high regard now. He is impressed by his bravery and the powerful punch that can defeat a monster in one hit, and that is why he pities that his power has been sealed off. Don says that power is everything in the world and the strong deserve everything. Seth yells at him and claims that while power is important, he will never use it the way they do. He claims that he will defeat them without magic, and Don decides to finish him off with a combo attack from the Brave Quartet. Their fart magic hits its mark, but luckily, Crazy Millie is out to deal with it. She blocks the attack and then attacks the thieves, taking two of them out, but Don and the dumb shield user are remaining. Seth rushes towards them, asking Crazy Millie to attack again, and she realizes that he plans to do so. She attacks again, and Seth uses the explosion from the attack to jump high and take down Don with a heel kick to his face. Only the dumb shield user is left now, and Crazy Melly puts him to sleep too. After that, she reverts to her base form again and thinks they should call security and turn the thieves in. Suddenly, Don gets up and takes her hostage after making her drop her wand. He tells Seth to go steal some treasure for him, but her pet Mr. Bubbly attacks him to save her friend. Millie is freed and the tiny bird's attack pushes Don to the edge of the roof. He falls and Seth immediately grabs his broom and chases him. He jumps off the roof to save him, but then realizes that he has to remove his gloves to use magic to operate the broom. However, Yaga threatened him with expulsion if he removed them, but Seth decides that it doesn't matter right now. He takes them off after braving the electric shock, and then flies at full speed towards Don. He saves him from hitting the surface and brings him back to the roof soon. Later, Seth visits Yaga and apologizes for taking off the gloves. Melly tries to explain that there was an emergency, but Seth tells her not to worry too much about it. Even if he is expelled, he plans to keep trying other ways to get stronger. Yaga tells him to calm down because he has not been expelled yet. He had seen everything Seth did through his magic crystal, and gives him a passing grade for realizing what is truly important. He then returns the gloves that he has repaired and turned into open finger gloves. Yaga tells him that the reason Seth cannot use magic properly with his gloves on is because he is not designed for it. He claims that since Seth can use magic barehanded, the gloves are a hindrance. Yaga tells him to try using them now and Seth can gather a great deal of magic now. Later, Seth and the entire group are at Melba's cafe and Yaga reads an article about the Holy Knights in the newspaper. Seth says that they are the villains in the story of all wizards. Yaga sighs as he calls him dumb, and explains that the Holy Knights are also humans after all, and there are good and bad people among them. He claims that labeling all of them as villains is not a good thing and wizards of all people should understand it because they are constantly being made out of bad guys without reason. Steph understands what he is saying. Despite his lecture, Yaga claims to have never met a friendly holy knight, but Melly believes that there must be someone like that. As they are talking about a holy knight, a dark who has been assigned on duty to keep a watch on Seth is fishing in the clouds. You may seem like your pothead neighbor, but flying fish do exist in this world, and he catches a few. One of the new soldiers thinks that he is unreliable, but his superior tells him that their captain is a man who delivers when the time for action comes. Later, Dark cooks the fish he caught and his men can't have enough of his food. The suspicious newbie is even more perplexed now, because he feels that being a holy knight is a noble job to fight dangerous wizards, and Dart is just a big disappointment. Dart notices the look on his face and runs into the rookie on a windy day. Suddenly, it starts raining and the vice captain and his crew get busy repairing it. The next day, as Dart is repairing his ship, he gets a report that another squad faced a monster in a battle, but they suffered serious losses and their ship broke down too. They meet up with Captain Edmund and his squad, who explain that they were attacked by a flying monster but managed to repel it. He doesn't care where the monster went after that and claims that they have to deliver the result of their mission to the headquarters. Dart is curious and Edmund shows him the alleged wizards he has captured in black silver cages. 
He haughtily asks Dart's men to repair his ship, and the new decides to ask to be reassigned to Edmund's squad after this because he sees no future with his current captain. Soon the repairs are complete, and as Dart tells Edmund about this, the giant monster that attacked their ship earlier flies over them. Edmund freaks out as he sees it, but Dart deduces that the monster is not interested in them and is heading towards a nearby town. Edmund is glad to hear that, and he is happy that the town will serve as a decoy so that they can escape this place. The rookie complains that it is unfair and a lot of people will die at this rate, but the asshole doesn't care about that anymore and claims that his only job as a holy knight is to capture wizards and nothing else. He even pulls rank on the rookie, but Dart steps in and says that holy knights only capture wizards because they have the potential to cause great destruction to normal people, and in this case, the monster is doing just that. He wants to fight against it, and as Edmund claims that they have no way to kill them, Dart's men get ready for battle. He addresses them, saying that facing a monster on their own without magic won't be easy, and they will be risking their lives, but despite that, everyone is ready to follow him into battle. At night, they return victorious from their fight with the monster and Edmund can't believe that they survived. He says he will take his leave now that his ship is repaired, but Dart points his bow at him, remarking that the ship no longer belongs to him. His vice-captain brings out all the captive people and claims that none of them is a wizard. Dart suspected it all along and knew what kind of man Edmund was and he has decided to arrest him for his crimes. He declares that he will get the General of the Holy Knights to judge him, and then regrets the current state of the organization, where people don't hesitate to endanger innocent people to climb up the ranks. Back in the Artemis city, Melly takes Seth on a tour of a festival. She tells him that Majesty throws some grand parties every once in a while to keep the spirits high. Seth thinks he's a fun guy after all, but Doc corrects him, explaining that the Yellow Cat throws these festive parties to earn money from their foreign guests and to keep political relationships with them strong. Seth and Melly share one brain cell and is on vacation right now, so they don't understand anything. Doc tells them to not mind it and asks them to join the broom race at the festival if they want to earn some spending money. As Seth reaches to register for the race, he finds that it costs a lot to just register for it. He starts whining about it when a rich, spoiled brat comes there and makes fun of him for being broke. His lackeys introduce him as Nick, the reigning champion of the broom race. He then turns to Seth because he has heard that he is almost disable. Almond is famous in Artemis as the lone wolf who refuses to work with other wizards. Nick mocks her, saying that she might be a weakling who doesn't want to show her pathetic side to others, and this pisses Seth off. He claims that she is really powerful, and Nick asks him to prove it by showing his worth as her disciple. He challenges Seth to the broom race, and he gladly accepts it. Nick leaves, and then Melly remarks that Seth seems to have a lot of faith in Alma, and asks him more about her. He realizes that he never told her about his mom and teacher and tells her that she was mean-looking and foul-tempered, but she always cared the most about him. Soon, the race starts and Seth finds out what real sports brooms look like. Nick has the latest and most expensive model of racing broom, and he teases Seth that he has no chance to win. Melly has also joined the race to support Seth, and she wants them to win together. The race starts, and Seth speeds ahead along with Melly. Everyone is surprised to see him going so fast, even with an old broom. He almost catches up with Nick. But then suddenly, a giant robot appears next to them. Majesty is operating the robot himself because he doesn't want to let anyone win and take the prize money home. He creates a disturbance and sends some of the racers flying away. He continues his onslaught, attacks the racers continuously, and keeps special attention on Seth. Melly protects him from some attacks, but then he decides to take things in his hands and flies towards Majesty's robot. He charges his titan punch to hit it, but the robot fires a magic beam at him. Everyone thinks he is done for, but Seth has learned how to use barrier magic now. He blocks the beam and breaks the robot, forcing Majesty to escape and self-destruct his ride. The explosion tosses Melly away from her broom, but Seth catches her and declares that they will cross the finishing line together. The race is nearing its end, with Nick still in the lead. Seth gives chase, but as everyone accelerates, Nick's lackeys lose control and fall. Nick crosses the finish line, but the crowd doesn't cheer for him. He turns around to find that Seth decided to give up his chance to win for saving his lackeys, and everyone is praising only him. The next day, Doc is at Melba's cafe, thinking that with the debt on his head, he might never be able to marry the woman of his dreams. He looks through the list of quests on his desk and rejects all of them for one reason or another. As he throws them into the air, calling all of them useless, one page falls on his face, and he finds that it pays a good amount for hunting a monster. Doc is about to reject it because it is too dangerous but Seth and Melly pop up right next to him and read the quest page. He tries to hide it, but Mr. Bubbly retrieves it. They read the request and find that it is from Rumble Town, which is under the control of Holy Knights. 
A monster has been spotted there, but the Holy Knights refuse to believe the civilians, so they have no choice but to ask wizards for help. Steve wants to help them and Melly seconds his opinion, but Doc doesn't plan to accept the request. They try to convince him because the money for capturing the monster is good, but Doc tries to shake it off by saying that this might be a prank or a trap from the Holy Knights to capture them. He tells them to go and deal with it alone if they are so insistent, because he has no taste for living dangerously. Suddenly, Melbo arrives there, picks up the quest page, and asks Seth if he is planning to capture a monster. She claims it will be tough and Seth replies that if the three of them work together, it won't be a problem. Doc is about to say that he isn't going anywhere, but Melba starts praising him, calling him a brave and passionate man who rushes to help those who are in need. That was all she needed to do to make the simp agree to take the request, and he curses himself for being such a pushover as he readies his ship to leave on the mission. Yaga is also there to wish Seth the best of luck and asks him to choose his battles carefully. They set out on their journey soon, but Dart spots them and contacts the General of the Holy Knights. Meanwhile, Seth is having fun riding towards the sunset, but Doc tells him to get back on the ship as they are about to enter the town. He claims that the town is under the control of the Holy Knights, so they won't welcome the wizards there, and asks Seth to keep his horns hidden. Seth obeys and then asks about the town and Meli replies that it is a remnant of the industrial age and everything there is louder than crying babies on a flight. She tells him that since the town itself makes constant noise, it is called Rumble Town. They find a quiet spot in the back alleys of the town and park their ship, and Seth can't stop gawking over the weird things in the city. Doc tells him to be quiet because Rumble Town is heavily populated and people can report them to the Holy Knights, but they find that there is no one nearby. They search for their client's address, but it is difficult to even know where they are in the maze-like town. Doc falls to his knees because of all the smoke, and as the group decides to take a rest, Millie finds that Mr. Bubbly is missing, so she and Seth leave to search for him, and they find him in a dark alley. He is angry at his human for leaving him behind and gives her a few good slaps. As Seth says they should head back now, something speeds across the road behind his back. Melly remarks that it must be the monster, and they immediately set out to capture it. They can't keep up with the monster's speed with their brooms, and it ambushes them, and sends them flying with wind magic. As they regain balance, Melly points out that there are two identical monsters. They attack him again, and Seth decides to face them head-on. He charges towards them and charges his magic attack while dodging their wind magic. He recalls Yaba's words to imagine the strongest thing in his mind before attacking and Seth thinks of Alma before launching his new move called Skull Attack. The powerful attack defeats one rat monster and the other one comes up to cover for it. Seth gets ready to defeat it too, but then suddenly, someone plays a flute and the rats immediately retreat upon hearing a familiar sound. Seth decides to pursue them and asks Meli to follow them from the sky and set a trap. He rides his broom and readies another random attack, but then suddenly, dozens of rat monsters come running. They are all heading in the same direction, like they are hypnotized, and as Seth is thinking about capturing all of them, someone grabs him and pulls him to the side. Seth crashes into a wall and ends up breaking his broom. He then looks ahead and finds a man cosplaying as a mummy, who asks him what his relation to the monsters is. Seth asks him who he is and what he wants, and the man introduces himself as the Wizard Grimm. He claims that the rat monsters are his prey, and they might be holding clues to a mystery he desperately wants to solve. He once again asks Seth to tell him what he plans to do with the monsters, and he replies that he has nothing to say to a freak like him. Grimm draws out a dark sword from his hand and threatens to attack Seth, who decides to attack first. He gets kicked away before he can punch the mummy, but he doesn't give up and attacks with a meteor drop, which Grimm easily counters. Seth follows with a heel kick, but his enemy blocks it and attacks him at close range with a powerful spell. He tells the boy to give up, but he is not ready to do that and uses Skull Attack on him. Grimm counters it too, and the collision of their spells results in a big explosion. Melly sees it and rushes to Seth's side, launching a surprise attack on the mummy. She can't believe that he dodged it all, but before they can continue their fight, Grimm declares that they have created too much noise and people will come here soon. He declares that he is a bit shy, so he will be taking his leave first, but promises to meet Seth soon again. As soon as he leaves, the citizens of the city come there along with some holy knights who spot Seth and Melly running away. The soldiers panic and rush to inform their captain, Conrad, about it, who asks the man to do a thousand push-ups for looking too disheveled. He asks him to deliver his report while doing push-ups, and he learns that two sorcerers destroyed a building in the city. A menacing grin spreads over Conrad's face as he declares that the time to hunt wizards has come. Soon, all the holy knights are mobilized to capture the wizards, who are hiding in a trash can. Doc lashes out at Seth for making the situation miserable for all of them, and he keeps on saying that it was all the money's fault. 
He informs him that there are too many monsters, and Doc starts daydreaming about getting rich and marrying Melba if they can capture them all. Meanwhile, Conrad is getting ready to capture the wizards himself when he finds Dart chilling in his living room. Dart used to be his superior once, but he did not take any promotions and now they are at the same rank. Conrad is not happy to see him here, he demands to know what he is doing in his city. Dart tells him that he is looking for some wizards on the loose and Conrad replies that they must be the ones who caused the destruction last night. He declares that he will be the one to catch them, but Dart tells him that he has direct orders from the general himself to not interfere with the wizards. He explodes on hearing that he is not allowed to capture the wizards on his own turf, and then Dart subtly manipulates him into doing what he wants. On the other hand, Seth and his friends reach out to the person who sent them the request. He initially refuses to know anything about it, but Crazy Melly threatens him to let them in. Once they are in the house, the man's wife tells their guests that her eldest son Taj saw a monster and came into contact with it. Seth and his friends think that the boy is already dead, but he comes out of his room to reveal that he is still alive. Doc says that he is really lucky to have survived coming into contact with a monster, but then the boy starts sneezing purple snot, which is the curse he got. Doc talks with the boy's parents, who claim that the Holy Knights do not believe them that a monster is on the loose in the city just because they are immigrants. The man fears that if the Holy Knights learn about his son being infected, they will take him away, and that is why he wants Doc and others to go back. Steph cannot tolerate this and declares that he will take care of all the monsters, and Taj offers to show him where to find them. As they walk around the town, Taj tells them that he only saw one giant monster. Melly explains that the big one must be the source monster that can infect humans and create offspring, which are smaller and do not infect anyone. Taj leads them to an abandoned factory where he was attacked by the monster, and Seth thanks him and asks him to leave everything else to him. They sneak into the factory, but as Seth breaks open a door, he finds a zebra-looking tree with glowing leaves. He has seen them a few times before with Alma, who told him that these trees grow where monsters are present, but he has never seen any tree bigger than this. Doc says that the source monster must have been in this place for a long time for the tree to grow so big. Suddenly, the ground starts rumbling, and they get out of the factory to find the Holy Knights evacuating civilians. They order them to go only to certain areas and threaten to arrest anyone who doesn't follow the orders. Doc figures out that the town is unstable, and the people are being moved to specific areas to balance it properly. He wants to go to the safe zones too, but Seth says they should wait here because they first encountered the monster when the town was empty. They keep watch from the sky, and soon the rat monsters come out. Melly tells Seth that if they can gather the monsters in one place, she can capture them, and he jumps from the broom and attacks a group of three monsters. He manages to trap them under rubble with his attack, but as he is laughing, one rat uses its tail to attack him with wind magic. Seth tries countering it with a meteor drop, but his attack gets blown away along with him. Melly and Doc rush to his aid, but he tells them to capture the monsters before they escape. Melly tells him to keep them down for a bit longer while she prepares her special magic. Seth holds the monsters and gets out of the danger zone just as Melly casts her magic, trapping the rats in a gravity cage. Everyone is happy and starts dreaming about what they will do with the money from capturing the monsters, but Melly says they still have to seal them inside special scrolls. As Seth and Doc cheer on her, more monsters keep dropping from above into the gravity prison. They think they are going to finally clear their debt now, but then suddenly, Grimm comes from the sky, and he kills the monsters using poison, shattering their dreams. He has now learned that Seth planned to capture the monsters alive, and he asks him if he was doing it on the orders of a certain woman. Seth tells him to stop spouting nonsense and prepares to attack him, but Grimm flees, citing that he has no interest in him. Doc tells Melee to bind him with her chain, and she does so, but her chain only touches him and then returns. She claims that he has been marked now and they will get notified whenever he is near them the next time. At night, Seth is still sulking about Grimm killing the monsters they captured alive and Doc believes that he is quite dangerous. He thinks he is the one behind the disappearance of numerous citizens in the past few days and thinks they should steer clear of him. Doc is feeling unwell after all the running and hiding and he tells Seth that he will be returning to Artemis the next day because he can't take it anymore. He doesn't hear any reasons, but Seth asks him about the symbol on the foreheads of the rat monsters earlier. Doc replies that all monsters have a mark on their bodies somewhere, and he has been researching that for years without any results. However, he knows one thing. If the mark is glowing, it means the monsters are being controlled by a wizard. This is news to Seth, and Doc says that these people who control the monsters are called Abominators, and they are regarded as enemies of humanity. On the other hand, Conrad is plotting unrest in the town, using some theater clowns who incite people against the immigrants. 
Dart sees it all and confronts Kamran about it, claiming that he is about to repeat a great tragedy from the past if he keeps up with his evil schemes. He doesn't care about his opinion and declares that the immigrants and the infected are not his citizens and he will purge them all. Dart asks him if he is so preoccupied with his genocide plans that he is letting the monsters go unnoticed, but he can't press Comrade further because he has no concrete proof. He decides not to interfere with his plan because Rumble Town is his territory, but he tells him that soon the General of the Holy Knights will be coming here with the Four Paladins. Comrade is taken aback and asks the reason for that, and Dart replies that it is because the General believes the Horned Wizard to be very dangerous, and he plans to deal with him personally. Conrad realizes he is screwed if the general finds anything amiss in the town, and he decides to hasten his plans and create havoc in the city before he arrives, using the wizards to spark unrest. On the other hand, Doc is getting ready to leave for Artemis, and Seth asks him if he is just going to abandon all the people here. Doc says he is done living in danger, and as Seth declares that he will stay behind and take care of the monsters, he tells him to do as he pleases. He really leaves and Melly wonders what they should do next. Seth feels hungry and thinks that they should go to Taj's place and eat something. However, as they reach their house, they find it has been badly damaged in a fight and everyone is missing. A neighbor comes there and informs them that this morning the authorities started rounding up all the infected people and immigrants, accusing them of starting a rebellion, and Taj and his family were captured too. Steph is worried about them, and he immediately rushes to save them. In the town square, Conrad addresses the angry mob, telling them that the immigrants were involved with the infected and the wizards, who were plotting a terrorist attack. He reminds them of a tragedy 15 years ago and tells them that the outsiders are here to steal their jobs, their homes, and their lives. Comrade then declares that he will protect them, and asks the citizens for their help in purging all the immigrants to purify their city. The mob is enraged now, and they charge towards the immigrant settlement, aiming to kill them. Dart saw it all, and he decides that he must intervene somehow. Seth and Melly are also looking for Taj's family from the sky, and they are worried about the public unrest. Doc is also stuck in the city because of the chaos, and as he tries to find a safe spot to hide, he finds the nest of the rat monsters. He wonders what the holy knights of the town are doing when a monster nest is in such an obvious place. He can't run away like a coward after seeing this and decides to tell Seth about the nest, but a holy knight arrives there and arrests him because he has seen something he should not have. Meanwhile, Taj has been captured and the angry townsfolk are about to burn him at stake. He begs them to stop, but they are at Damon about killing him since he is infected. Suddenly, Seth arrives at the scene and touches one of the aggressors, telling him that he is infected now. Everyone runs away because of that, and Seth comforts Taj before Melly comes to take them away. As they reach a safe spot, Seth asks Taj about his parents and learns that the Holy Knights took them away. Melly thinks that the unrest is being instigated by someone, and Seth believes that it is the bastard named Conrad. Suddenly, the people find them and rush towards them. Seth asks Melly to help them escape. But she has switched to her crazy side and declares that if the people are trying to kill them, they should fight back. Seth tries to convince her that they just need to deal with Conrad, but since she doesn't listen, he just carries her and starts running. He says that they must not harm the people and only focus on the main culprit, when suddenly, a cannonball comes flying towards them. Conrad has assembled his artillery unit and arrived in person to deal with the wizards as the final part of his plan. He tells them to surrender peacefully, or he will launch an all-out attack despite the civilians being present at the scene. Seth is enraged and attacks the Holy Knights, but their shields block his attacks. As the swordsmen leap at him, Crazy Melly comes and saves his life. Conrad joins the battle himself, wielding a giant ass lance, and attacks Seth with it. Melly tries to back him up, but Dart arrives at the scene and shoots her wand out of her hands. Stiff wants to fight back, but Conrad points out that they have captured Doc and tells him not to do anything reckless. He then commands Melee to be thrown in prison as well and smashes Seth to the ground. Dart tells him not to be too rough with the boy because the general needs him alive, so Conrad takes his gloves off, thinking he can't use magic without them. Dart gives him a subtle warning about not underestimating the boy and then leaves the scene. Conrad gets a message that the public is getting out of control and he gets an excellent idea to deal with him. He takes Seth to the immigrant settlement that has been set on fire and presents Seth before the angry mob, declaring him to be the mastermind of the potential terror attack. He also has Taj with him, and he declares that the immigrants were hiding a nest of monsters in the slums. Sid screams that they are wrong and someone called a Dominator is controlling them and Conrad smirks as he tells him that he is right. He then addresses the mob and tells them that they need to exterminate the immigrants without mercy, and they all agree with him. However, he shuts the gates of the slums with the mob still there and declares that they will also die in the slums so the city can stay safe. The people shout at him to stop, but he commands the cannons to open fire. Seth is enraged at him, punches him in the face, and sends him crashing down. 
Connor can't believe that he can use magic without his gloves, but that doesn't matter anymore. He drinks forbidden muscle juice and suddenly buffs up, but loses his hair as a side effect. His soldiers fire the cannons on his command, but then suddenly, the cannonballs stop in midair and Grimm arrives next to Seth, absorbing all the cannonballs into his body. He hits Seth with a we need to talk and ties a bandage around his arm before asking him if he is associated with the Dominator with the flute. Seth replies that he has no idea who he is talking about and Grimm asks him why he was working with the rat monsters then. Steph tells him that they were just capturing the monsters alive and the mummy cosplayer trusts him. He shoots the cannonballs he has absorbed into his body and wipes out the entire artillery in an instant. Seth asks him why he is suddenly helping them and Grimm apologizes to him for the misunderstanding between them earlier. He explains that he was here to look for a woman with a flute who can control monsters, and he mistook Seth and his group for her allies. Suddenly strong winds start to blow towards the clock tower and atop it is the woman with the flute and her rat monsters. She gathers all the magic in the region and then commands her monster army to attack the city. Grimm immediately takes action and rushes to stop her and Seth decides to join him after telling Taj to hide somewhere. However, Comrade is still raging to finish their fight and he jumps up to his location using his lance. Seth tells him there is no time to fight when the town is in danger, but Conrad tells him that he doesn't mind and he was the one who hired the Dominator girl to do the dirty deeds for him. With that, he gets ready for the fight and attacks Sif, who blocks it with a shield. The shield shatters easily, and as Seth tries to attack Conrad, he dispels his attack with his lance made of white silver, which completely nullifies magic. Conrad has the upper hand in the fight and presses Seth down but gets furious when he points at his stupidly long mustache. Taj is hiding as he watches them fight, and he thinks that he must head past them to open the gates that are keeping everyone in the danger zone. On the other hand, Doc's condition keeps on worsening in the cage and Melly finds that he has no pulse. She cries that he has died, and then suddenly, a shield hits the cage and unlocks it. While she is still mourning the death of her friend, her pet comes with her wand and points towards the rat monster, overwhelming two soldiers nearby. Melly decides that she cannot sit here and cry and she steps outside to deal with the monster. She squears that she won't let anyone die on her watch anymore. She fights with monsters on her way but ends up in a place where Dart is leading his men. He has his bow pointed at her, but he uses it to scare away a monster attacking her from behind. He commands his men to ignore the wizard right now and deal with the monsters because that takes higher priority. Grimm charges ahead, taking down all the monsters in his way. He wonders why the girl with the flute is doing this now and if there is some grand scheme behind her actions. Suddenly, the girl gathers enough magic and casts a spell that takes her voice all over the town. She tells people that the chaos right now is just like the tragedy 15 years ago and the only thing missing is the ground caving in under their feet. She declares that she will make that happen and creates a storm around the clock tower, sending the bell ringing like crazy. Back at Seth's location, Taj realizes that he must open the gate at all costs and rushes across the battlefield. Connor tries to attack him but Sith holds his lance and gives Taj the chance to run away, but he fails to open both gates. The battle resumes and Seth blasts his magic attacks at Conrad, who repels them all with his lance. As he stops to boast about his abilities, Seth throws his boot at his face before hitting him with a kick boosted with magic power. In doing that, he steals Conrad's mustache and mocks him. The Knight Captain is calm despite the legendary L he took because he has realized that Seth is at his limits. He smashes him to the ground and moments later the bell of the tower is uprooted because of the storm that sends it flying. Seth says that the ground will collapse no matter where it hits and Conrad laughs, saying that it is programmed to hit the slums. He thinks that his longtime ambition will come true today, but little does he know that the girl with the flute has other plans. The bell falls in the main part of the city where everything important is located. Conrad is horrified as he sees this and wonders why this is happening when the girl with the flute laughs and decides to unravel her villain origin story. Fifteen years ago, four infected kids were taken from their homes to be turned into weapons to fight monsters, and the girl named Hamelin was one of them. They were thrown in prison and forced to live in harsh conditions. And then one day, the civilians started demanding they be killed. They were terrified, but one kind old knight played his flute badly to make them laugh. He gifted the flute to the kids, and they started to get closer to him. However, there was someone who did not like these developments. It was the younger Conrad who hated immigrants and the infected with all his heart. He threatened the infected ones, but the old knight caught him in the act and told him to treat everyone as fellow humans. While he retreated at that time, Conrad soon executed a diabolical plan. He acted as a mysterious helper and freed the budding wizards while telling the people about their escape. They were trapped as soon as they reached the city and only Hamelin survived the violent attacks from the angry mob. Luckily, the kind knight saved her and brought her back, but Conrad was still not satisfied. 
Soon, a monster egg fell from the sky, throwing the city into chaos. Kamari convinced the kind Meg captain to let him take charge of the evacuations and asked him to use the help of the wizard girl to fight against the monster. As the knight brought Hamlin out, Conrad stabbed him from behind. He was about to kill the girl too, but the knight pinned him to the wall with his dying breath, giving Hamlin a chance to escape. She ran as fast as she could but tripped and fell down while crying. Suddenly, she saw her flute and decided to play it because there was nothing better she could do. It was at that moment that her powers activated and her magic brought all the rat monsters to her. She freaked out upon seeing them initially, but soon learned that they were not here to harm her. She found that they liked her music and seeing them hurt and miserable, she realized they were like her and her friends. The girl pitied them, and as the holy knights started blasting their cannons towards them, the monsters took her to safety. However, a part of the town that housed the immigrants collapsed because of the reckless attack, and that was when her heart froze over. Now she's back for revenge. Everyone has heard the story of Conrad's evil deeds and he has no shame to declare his hate for immigrants and that he is ready to sacrifice normal people to eradicate them. The people suddenly start cursing him after finding his true intentions, and they think that Hamlin is on their side. She tells them that they couldn't be more wrong because she's going to kill them all for their sins too. She attacks the chains that keep the town together, and the people complain that they have nothing to do with her revenge. The girl lashes out at them, calling them equally guilty of trying to kill innocent people, and declares them her enemy. Just as she is about to deal a finishing blow, Grim arrives at the scene and dispels her magic, stating that he needs to ask her some questions. Connor takes this chance and orders his soldiers to bombard the slum with the remaining explosives they have, and they obey. Seath is furious after hearing the truth, and he calls Conrad the weakest man in Rumble Town who can't achieve a single thing without deceiving people. This hits a nerve with the bald man, and he charges towards Seth, who slaps away his lance with just one hand. Conrad is shocked and attacks him again. But Seth hasn't taken any damage, and he uses magic power to launch himself into the battle again. His punch pushes Conrad back, and he lands a powerful blow to his stomach and then one to his face. Conrad attacks Seth with full power, but he concentrates magic in his fists to block the lance. Conrad slaps him into the air and then shoots his lance head to finish him. But as he pulls it back, he finds that Seth has absorbed the attack just like Grimm did with the cannonballs. Seth gathers all the magic power he can and launches everything towards Conrad. He blocks it with his lance, but it doesn't hold up for long and gets shattered, leaving him wide open. Seth then delivers a devastating punch to his face, defeating him for good. As the dust settles, Seth pulls out the lance head from the bandages and falls unconscious. His attack destroyed the wall too, and the citizens ran back to their homes while Taj was reunited with his family. Seth gets up and starts to leave, but Dart appears behind him and tells him that he is under arrest. The chains holding the town up start breaking and Seth shouts that it is not the time to arrest him when the people are in danger. He asks Dart what kind of holy knight he is if he can't get his priorities straight, and he asks him if he can still talk about that crazy dream of his. Seth declares that he will surely destroy Radiant one day and impressed by his determination, Dart asks him to deal with a monster-controlling wizard, telling him that he will get arrested immediately after that. Grimm is already fighting with her, and despite being more powerful and skilled than her, he can't get the upper hand in the battle. He asks her questions about who taught her the art of controlling monsters, but she doesn't give him an answer. He sends a smoke screen towards her, and as it clears, he has her at the point of his sword. He takes two names, asking if she is related to them, but since Hamlin doesn't react, he realizes she is not involved with them. Grimm says that he will just kill the monsters and leave in that case, but she is angry on hearing this and attacks him with a hidden blade. As soon as he sees his blood, Grimm freaks out and runs away. On the other hand, Millie is unconscious and wakes up when Miss Bubbly shakes her up. She thinks she failed to protect her friends again and traumatic memories make her heart heavy. Overwhelmed by strong emotions, she turns into a crazy Millie and starts slashing the rat monsters without mercy. Steph approaches her from behind and she almost kills him but stops at the last moment. As she sees him, she reverts to normal and hugs him while crying that Doc died. Seth tells him that Doc is with him and pulls out a baby that looks just like Doc. Melly freaks out upon seeing him and Seth explains that while he was running around the town earlier, he found Doc's dead body, but then suddenly, baby Doc appeared from his belly. He couldn't believe what just happened, but now he has come to terms with the fact that his curse is molting like insects. Melly is overjoyed and swings Doc around, but then her wand suddenly glows and a ball of light comes out of it. Melly exclaims that is the tracker she put on Grimm and moments later, he comes from the direction in which the light ball went. He tells them that he is no longer their enemy and warns them about Hamelin and her monsters. He tells Seth that the enemies are too powerful for him and tells him to retreat while he kills all the monsters. 
Seth says he won't allow that and Grimm asks him if he has some other plan. He has none, but Melly suggests that she can restrict the girl using an item, and he can deal with the monsters in the meantime. Grimm agrees with the idea and decides to help, but Doc doesn't want to be a part of it at all. They leave him somewhere safe, and then head towards Hamelin. She sends her rat monster minions to attack them and Seth charges ahead and blows them all away with his powerful skull attack. The girl brings forth even more monsters and uses wide area wind magic, pushing Seth back, but then someone saves him. He wakes up inside a tower and a hooded man appears before him. Seth asks him who he is and the man removes his hood to reveal two horns on his head, just like him. The man introduces himself as Piotin and claims that he is just an observer who likes seeing how the world works. He points towards the bandage on Seth's face and asks him why he is not removing it, because it will allow him to use his true power. Seth doesn't believe him and explains that the bandage just covers an ugly scar he got from the monster he first encountered and Alma told him to never take it off. Piotin sighs, saying that Seth doesn't understand how magic works, but he can't undo the seal for him. He asks him if he doesn't want more power, but Seth doesn't get what he is getting at. Piotin asks him who he is working for because no matter whose side he takes, there are some evildoers everywhere. Before Seth can give him his answer, the tower rumbles and he decides to take his leave, thanking Piotin for saving him. As he watches the boy go, Piotin mutters to himself that they will meet again soon in hopes that he doesn't die because he is his only family in the world. Meanwhile, Melee and Grimm head towards Hamelin, assured that Seth survived. Grimm uses his smokescreen magic and Melee goes behind the girl and uses a powerful ceiling magic on the monsters, but the girl blocks it, shouting that she won't let anyone harm her brothers. She dispels the magic and Melly jumps on her, marking her with her wand. Hanlin pushes her back and attacks her with wind magic. She declares that no one can stop her vengeance on the town, and Melly begs her to not hurt anyone anymore. Hanlin declares that these people took everything from her, and this time she will take everything from them, and Melly has no reply to that. Grim appears behind her and the girl decides to attack him, but all her magic leaves her body and gets collected in the giant lantern Melly is carrying. She marked her earlier to steal her magic power, making her unable to use magic and control her monsters. Grim says that Seth has asked him not to kill the Dominator, but he does not have the ability to kill anyone in the first place. He takes out a giant scroll from his pocket and from within it, he takes out a giant sword and swings it towards the monsters, slicing effortlessly through them. However, Hamelin absorbs all the monsters into her scroll, telling Grimm not to underestimate her bond with her brothers. Their magic powers combine and she launches a powerful wind attack. Grimm's sword runs out of its usage duration and returns to the scroll, and Melly complains that she cannot do anything if the girl combines her magic with the monsters. Hamelin is ready to blast them off for good, but then suddenly, the floor behind her breaks, and Seth comes out of it to join the fight. Hamelin puts some distance between them and points her sword at him. She calls him a fool for coming to fight her after he survived her attack earlier and rushes towards him. Seth dodges her attacks and absorbs her blade thanks to the bandages. He declares that he will stop her and Hamelin blasts him with her wind magic. He comes out unharmed and claims that her attack does not hold a candle to Alma's punishment or Yaga's training while he keeps trying to hit her. Hamelin takes the skies to put some distance between them and attacks him from there and Seth replies with a full power skull burst. Hamelin's attack overpowers him as she says that he is helping his enemy and Seth replies that he is just helping normal people. She gets furious upon hearing this and increases the intensity of her attack, telling him that the people are not worth saving. Seth gets hit by the attack, but he gets up and tells Hamelin that the people are just afraid for their lives and just defeating Conrad has solved the problem. She calls him an idiot for thinking that, explaining that the people are the ones who let the Holy Knights commit atrocities against the innocent wizards. She plans to kill them all and doesn't like it when Seth tells her that she is doing the same thing Connor was doing. She tells him that no matter how hard he tries, the people won't accept wizards. They will treat them as infected outcasts and fear and loathe them. She tells him to pick the correct side to fight for and Seth declares that he will save everyone. Hagelin takes his answer to mean that he will save the innocent people from a crazy wizard like her and bombards him with attacks, telling him that those people are as innocent as Hitler. She attacks him with all of her power, saying that if he wants to protect people like them, he is nothing like her. Seth gets pressed to the ground because of her attack, but he presses back, screaming that she is wrong and they are the same. As the city faces the impact of their battle, Grimm uses his magic to find that the fight is already over and Seth and Hamelin are on the same page. She comes down to talk to him within the cyclone, and he tells her that she is right and that he cannot forgive the people for what they have done to him. He claims that he wanted to destroy everything many times too, and she asks him what about now. Stith tells her that he could easily have harmed the people hurting him, but Alma had forbidden it, so he did not. 
He tells Hamelin that he understands her pain and he knows she is right in her place for wanting revenge. She is moved and takes support from his shoulder, but then Seth tells her that he won't let her become the monster people think wizards are. He throws away the scroll holding all her tamed monsters, and then grabs her sword and pins her to the ground. He doesn't attack her, but as the storm disperses, Hamelin can only cry that she was fooled. She calls Seth a dog of the holy knights who will now bring her to his masters and see her executed. He shouts that she is wrong and he will not turn her in. Hamelin tells him that there is no point in sitting on the fence and he must choose one side or the other. She calls him a fool who can't even select who he wants to fight for, and tells him to kill her himself, rather than turn her in. Steph tells her that he knows what he is fighting for. He declares her goal to destroy Radiant, and asks Hamlin to join him. She is taken aback by his grand dreams and thinks that they might not even be possible. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking again and the clouds part as a giant human projection made of golden light descends. Everyone's astonished to see the sight, and moments later, they recognize a holy mech battleship coming down from the clouds, and they exclaim that they are safe now. Dart realizes that a paladin is using divine powers to create a miracle, and he thinks that it is not a good idea. He thinks that just dealing with one berserk dominator is not reason enough to call in the big guns, and he wonders if the paladin is here because of Seth after all. The paladin then asks the wizards to surrender and hand over the horned wizard to them. He starts listing Seth's crimes, and there are a lot of them. Steph doesn't even know what he is talking about, but somehow he gets a vague feeling that he knows the names he is taking. Seth tries to convince the paladin that he has the wrong guy, when suddenly Hamlin springs to action and takes him hostage. She offers to negotiate with the paladin, using his life as the bargaining chip, because she knows that they want him alive. Seth asks her what she is doing, and she whispers that she will get as much value out of him as possible. Hamlin walks him towards the giant projection and asks the paladin to free all the wizards in their prison in exchange for Seth, but he refuses. She was anticipating this, and she suddenly attacked him by reaching the giant scroll. Her powerful wind attack only deals light damage to the paladin's hand, and he laughs at her power. Seth is still processing what happened when Hamlin gives her scroll to him. She asks him to take good care of her brothers inside it, and pleads not to treat them as monsters. Seth still doesn't understand anything and Hamelin smiles as she says that she likes that expression. Then with a kiss, she walks ahead, declaring that she will stay loyal to her goals until the end and fight for them. She engages the paladin's projection in a battle, and Grim and Melly take Seth away despite his constant screaming. Hamelin wants Seth to be safe and keep chasing his dream because she believes in him. She manages to block the first punch from the paladin, but before anything else can happen, the general holy knight stabs her from behind. As she dies, Hamelin asks Seth to change the world, and he can only scream. He leaps at the general named Torque, but a Dutch bag paladin arrives at the scene and smacks him down. He plans to finish Seth for good, but just as he is about to strike him down, Pyodin suddenly makes Seth activate his sealed powers. He releases a great deal of magic power, creating an explosion and loses his consciousness as his arms turn black. The Dutch bag is furious because his face got scratched and he lunges at Seth, only to get done in by one slap. Next is the Paladin Santori, who uses his gigantic projection to attack Seth, but after taking one blow from him, he temporarily loses the function of one hand. Torque realizes that Seth is a dangerous beast and he must slay him down immediately. He calls upon the power of the Founder of Holy Knights and brings forth a halo using a miracle. With his divine power, Torque sends powerful slashes towards Seth to disbalance him and then attacks him directly. He believes that the boy cannot sustain that form for long, but Seath still has some fight left. He gets Torque with a powerful punch, but he blocks it with his sword and then pushes him away. Seth holds onto the edge of the tower, and then Satora punches him away. Seth somehow gets away from the general's sight after this, and he sends one of the remaining paladins to search for him. Grim and Millie are carrying him away at full speed, and they have no idea what the beast-like form Seth just showed. Melly is concerned because he looked like a monster, but Grim tells her that they have no time to waste because the Holy Knights are looking for them. He takes out a magic coffin and opens it, releasing a horde of people trapped inside it. Melly freaks out on seeing it, but Grim tells her that these are all infected people or those who saw Conrad's evil deeds, and he hid them to protect them from prosecution. He is not pleased to learn that these people were said to be missing because of a monster attack. And then Doc also comes out of the coffin. Melly tries to stop his screaming, and she wonders how they can get away from this island with the condition of their group. Grim tells her there is no need to worry because their Uber is here. Majesty has sent his personal aircraft to take back the Debt King. The ship's crew launches fireworks to keep the people and the Holy Knights distracted as they take the wizards away. The unconscious Seth dreams of his friends and as he sees memories of Hamelin, he gets trapped by the guilt of not being able to save her. 
He thinks that his actions only flung the island into chaos, and he furiously asks Piotin, who has made his way into his subconscious mind about what he did to him earlier. Piotin replies that he was about to die, and that was the only way to save him. Seth says he didn't want him to, and he regrets that when he transformed, he became a monster who couldn't tell his friends and enemies apart. He claims that he also saw strange memories when he was in beast mode, and he blames Piotin for them too. However, he replies that those memories belong to Seth, but he has forgotten them. He points at the hazy fog around him, telling him that these are all of his memories that he will have to unlock gradually. Seth asks him who he is and why he knows so much and Piotin claims that he is his elder brother. Seth is shocked, but he tells him to go away because he needs some time alone. It has been one week in the real world and Crazy Meli and Doc are worried sick about Seth, since he hasn't woken up yet. As they are quarreling about when he will wake up, he opens his eyes. His friends are relieved to see him, and as he gets up, he notices Grimm's bandages around his body. Doc gets trauma flashbacks on hearing that name and says he doesn't want to see him again, but Grimm suddenly appears on the window. He tells Seth that General Torque has the power to completely nullify magic, and the injuries he gives won't heal with any magic. Grimm believes that Seth might lose the function of one of his arms, and he whines, saying that it will be for the better since that hand committed needless acts of violence. He also wants to know what happened to Rumble Town, and Grimm explains that the Paladins have taken charge of rescue and restoration, and there is no clue about what became of Conrad. Seth thinks that the Holy Knights were the ones who saved the town in the end, but at least Hainland's monster friends are living peacefully in an enclosure within the Academy. He is glad to hear that he could at least help them. Some time passes after the Rumble Town incident and Seth is on the path to recovery, but he seems to have lost his enthusiasm for things. As they go to Melba's cafe, she's glad to see them back, but Doc is too nervous to face her in his baby form. Contrary to his dreadful expectations, Melba finds him incredibly cute and hugs him, and he is glad that he became a baby. As Seth and his friends finish eating, Melba says that today's food was special because it was prepared for the heroes who save Rumble Town. Steph doesn't feel any better as Melba explains that they are the talk of the town, and they are in the newspaper as well. He has received credit for defeating the Holy Knights and the evil wizard, and that makes him feel bad about Hamlin. Suddenly, they get a message from Majesty, who is throwing a party to celebrate their success in Rumble Town. Melly is really excited to go to the party and invites Melba with her, but Seth has lost even more of his will. Later at night, they go to Majesty's palace to attend the party, and Seth notices that Doc has grown a bit taller. He explains that he spent all his savings to buy a growth potion so that he could dance with Melba, but the effect of the potion was random, and he only grew by a few years. The lights go out, and the yellow cat makes his appearance before putting the spotlight on the star of the evening, Seth. The crowd cheers him on, and then Majesty yoinks him onto the stage. Steph doesn't like getting so much attention, but Majesty starts telling his life story about how he came from a small village and became the King of Debt in Artemis before fighting a holy knight captain and an evil dominator. As everyone calls him a hero and cheers him on, Seth thinks about Hamelin's death and gets even more upset. Majesty asks him what he plans to do next and he replies that he will destroy Radiant. The crowd is a vibe and they say that their debt king can destroy tens of thousands of Radiants. Majesty tosses him into the crowd where all the thirsty girls want a piece of him, but he squirms his way out of the crowd, only to run into Nick. Nick claims that he is just lucky to get this famous because he could have saved Rumble Town in a smarter way than him. That is why he wants to challenge Seth to a duel to prove to everyone that he is the hero of Artemis. Seth has no interest in dueling him and Nick starts teasing him, saying that he must have, saying that he must have,